I love it. Hello, and welcome to the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on WOZO Radio 103.9 LPFM here in Knoxville, Tennessee. We're recording this on Sunday morning, January 21st, uh, 2024. I'm Larry Rhodes, or DJ Doubter5. And as usual, we have our co-host, Wombat, on the line with us. Hello, Wombat. It's the Wombat. Yep. Staying welcome. warm. Yeah. Digital Free Thought Radio Hour is a talk radio show about atheism, free thought, rational thought, humanism, and the sciences. And conversely, we'll also talk about religion, religious faiths, gods, holy books, and superstition. And if you get the feeling that you're the only non-believer in your town, well, you're just not. You're in Knoxville in the middle of the Bible Belt. We have a group of over 1,100 of us. We're the Atheist Society of Knoxville, or ASK, and we'll tell you more about us after the mid-show break, so be sure to stick around. Wombat, what's our topic today? I want to talk about snowflakes today, and what better time to talk about snowflakes when our towns, respectively, are entirely covered with a layer yeah. of ice. Yeah. How's your how's many your states? <laughs> yeah, <For that> matter. <laughs> true, true, true. Many states, though. I think the Tennesseans and anyone below us are more prone to complain about it than anyone else, right? How how's been your winter stay? Oh, it's fine. I just feel cooped up in the house. I'm getting yep. spring fever, and it's the yep. middle of winter. <laughs> Ten thousand percent. My job had uh, basically shut down because you know our town is you know fairly rural. We don't have a lot of people shaving the snow off so our main roads are good but all the side roads all the suburb areas all the back roads are completely covered in in slush that quickly became compacted ice and as a result it was just not safe as deemed by our management to go to work so we've been home working from home for the last week and well my job is working from home i've been doing that for a year and a half two years two over two years now so it didn't really affect my work schedule it didn't affect your motorcycle expeditions or anything like that? That it did affect. Okay, okay. <laughs> I, okay. As a matter of fact, I'm a little worried about my bike. Um, it's outside. This is the first winter I've had it outside. I've got it covered, and then I have a tent over it. Mm. But it got down to minus three. I usually would not be subjected to that type of cold. For and, callers of the show, when you say minus three, given that we are kind of a science show is that fahrenheit or celsius what are you talking fahrenheit, about? fahrenheit it's fahrenheit ah, okay okay yeah. okay continue that's way well, that's yeah pretty cold pretty okay. cold and all the snow built up on the tent out there and collapsed the tent mm. so my, my bike is under a tent and sub freezing weather so uh, we'll see how it works out in, in the spring but yeah. i don't want to do much to it in this this weather it's currently 14 degrees out there so i'm not going out there to work with it Okay, so we've been consistently under, I would say, at least negative two Celsius. That's mm-hmm. like a roughly 32, maybe less than that, way less than that in Fahrenheit. But though we've gone as low as negative 19 Celsius. Wow. And, uh, it's been a very a Celsius, dry. Yeah. yeah, it's been mm-hmm. a very dry cold. And mm-hmm. I am a very social person, or at least when I'm at home. When I'm at work, I can do my work solitary or in my teams. But when I'm home or when I'm off work, I like to be hanging out with people, disc golf or rock climbing, or I'm making music, or I like to just go out and walk. There's like a, a nice little group of people we can play roller hockey with. I like I'll find, or there's a gym that I go to on a regular basis. There's classes I go to on a regular basis. All that shut down because we can't have any modes of travel. And I yeah. can tell you something being locked up has made me more appreciative of, you know, uh, recognizing why people need a community. And when typically when they find them in church, to just have like people that can consistently talk with because mm-hmm. it's not fun being cooped up. I can feel no. myself as a social creature reaching out. Yeah. Well, thank goodness for the internet. I mean, we can do things <laughs> like this show, yeah, you know, and you, you and I meet weekly, <laughs> <laughs> have good chat. Yeah. Uh, I can and, tell you it's really good for mental health to be able to just talk to people. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If you can imagine just you in a fireplace, like oh so many God. people like up North in Canada and Alaska and stuff, you know, just, mm. I could not deal with that very long. No, it's very true. Not only that, but I found myself with more time thinking to myself. And that's, it wasn't like COVID, but like just more time cooped up looking at nature around me. And it's just this wide expanse. And out my window, I get little flecks of snow uh, that hits. And some of them look like little snowflakes. And I thought, man, I forgot about snowflakes. Don't you forget about things? Like kids will be like, hey, I'm going to draw a turkey and they'll draw their hand. And you're like, that looks nothing like a turkey. I haven't you seen a turkey before, but you remember you did that when you were a kid. 
I remember the same thing where you would fold up yeah. a piece of paper, cut it, uh-huh. and then rip it out. You've done this before? And you'd be like, it's a snowflake. There's no as other a kid. snowflake just yeah. like this, right? Mm-hmm. As a kid. I looked at this window and I couldn't believe it because there were just these beautiful, beautiful little crystalline little specks of, of ice on my on my window. All of them so intricate, all of them so beautiful. And I thought to myself, this is crazy. You're telling me all the thing, all the snow, or at least uh, not a majority of it, but uh, there's a there's so many flakes that are like this beautiful thing that will last for like a couple of seconds and then be gone after it melts. Mm-hmm. Out in nature, if I didn't know any better, and if I was prone to believe in a God that created the universe, I would have no better evidence to present of the intentional design of the universe than looking at snowflakes. And you know what? I'd be almost hard pressed to to deny that if I didn't have better, what do you call it? A better understanding of how a better scientific occur. understanding of how how they occur yeah like crystallization and nuclea and stuff like that like i want mm-hmm. like nucleation is what i mean but like to be able to see if if i didn't have that understanding i would look at a person who said these snowflakes are proof that a god exists and i'd be like man they got a good point <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> what do you think well yeah if you were told from your very earliest childhood that god mm. designed everything then it's yes. a given Right. Especially if I went through the practice of actually making a snowflake myself. Like if I gave, if you gave me a piece of folded paper and I went through the machinations of cutting it and then unfolding it and then seeing the design that I inputted and be like, this is a snowflake and that's snowflakes. Well, then clearly this looks designed and that looks designed, right? Like I'm imitating something to the point where I can conflict the two in terms of their origin. And I don't, and you made up. You made a good point. If you were taught like that as a kid, it's not a difficult thing to accept. But also, there's a the way how I think about this, and this is the the main point I want to bring up. There's there's a there's a woeful element to this where, if your standard of how reality works is based off of something that doesn't care about how reality works, then your degree of awe when you look at reality might be the same as someone who really, really appreciates it and understands like, man, I just can't tell you how all these pressure and temperature differences and the small little contaminants in the air cause these differences in nucleation patterns that lead to all these different forms of crystallization in in snow. And we can like even make our own snow knowing that we know how these processes work. That's how we make artificial snow. And, mm-hmm. and like when we look at nature, we can see, mm-hmm. yeah, there are going to be, there's going to be slight overlaps, but everything's going to be consistently different because the situations of how they were crystallizing were different. And that's kind of interesting too. And then a person who's like, oh, that's too much words for me. I just want to believe in God and say God did it. And we both have the same appreciation for ah, but I feel like it's in completely opposite different points of view because for one person, they are appreciating a, uh, a, a, a really cool, testable, objectable series of phenomena, physics and, and machinations that lead to like a universe that we're all relying on. Like our bodies work on the same phenomena, like in terms of like how particles interact with each other, water sure. physics, mm-hmm. temperature, pressure controls. Like this is cool. Like, and we're a part of this too, down to like how our minds work and how medicine works. This is amazing. I want to learn more about it. Or you can do the, but I don't want to know anything about the spiritual stuff because there's not anything testable there. But on the mm-hmm. flip side, you have people who are like, I don't care about your science stuff. I only care about the spiritual thing because it's a nice compact answer that gives me a nice warm feeling in my heart and gives me solace for when, if I die, I get to spend time with the spiritual thing, even though I can't mm-hmm. test that <laughs> right. until after I yeah. die. You don't have your answer until after you die, right? Right. It kind of reminds me of like people who, who don't like each other I mean, there's so much animosity between, in my mind, those who are unwilling to change their mind on dogma versus those who are willing to be a bit more, who, those who aren't willing to be more empathetic and engage with people who have dogmatic points of view in, in a more potentially less argumentative fashion, despite the fact that they are right, the approach that they're doing it is actually causing a backfire effect where more people who have that dogma aren't, aren't willing to you know, cross the barrier. It's not, and that's not their fault either, but it's just, it's a shame that we have so much conflict over something that we both appreciate, which is snowflakes. We both like snowflakes, right? Mm -hmm. Our reasonings might be completely different, but like, can we just agree that snowflakes are awesome? And then can't we not agree that like, if you knew how snowflakes are actually made and that we can make our own and that we can like figure out why these things exist. And then we can use that same logic on other stuff too, consistently to understand how other things in nature work. 
Like, isn't that amazing too? And yeah, then, and, and <laughs> given the conditions, you know, the weather conditions and temperatures and stuff, the snowflakes are inevitable. Yes. It's not like, you know, he just decides to make them and they're there. Uh, we can recreate it because we know the situations in which they are made. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I feel like the this is the part where I feel like Christian would say, well, why can't scientists just appreciate the fact that God made everything? Like here, here's the contention, because if we if we if I, I think a Christian can appreciate the science behind snowflakes, along with their God belief, if they want to. I don't feel like they're contradictory, but someone who's secular minded would have a problem taking on the, the spiritual element of the Christian's point of view. And my opinion, one of the hard parts I would have is, so you're telling me God is sitting down, cutting spiritual paper and making brand new snowflakes for every, every year. Where would he get the time? On a, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the infinite amount of time. And I'm like, and then while he's doing that, there's little notifications on his spiritual phone being like, uh, Brandon, a uh, uh, three-year-old kid has cancer. He's like, ah, I'll, I'll deal with that later. Uh, mm -hmm. New microbe needs to be designed to kill 40,000 people. It's like, ah, I'm, I'm not, I'm making snowflakes over here. Leave me alone, guys. Mm -hmm. This is going to land you know what, somewhere in the North Pole. It's going to be beautiful. You know, what gets me is uh, the sheer volume of time and eternal creature. Like, even in this universe alone, if, mm. if, if, uh, if there was what, 14 and a half billion years old and humanity, even according to the Bible, have only been around for what, 7,000 years, 6,000 years. And Jesus is coming next, next year, next week, next, whatever. That means that the entire lifespan of humanity on earth would only be like 8,000 years, but he has the eternity to exist before man and an eternity to exist after man. I guess he's got a lot of time to do snowflakes then. You know, he yeah. can always jump forward, make a false snowflake, and come back. But what a total and incredible waste of time. It's a big waste of time, unless if it's sort of like a... So you were bringing this up. You brought this point up, Larry. You had mentioned this, and I think it's kind of funny. You had mentioned that if if the heaven was real and you spend eternity there, you're going to get bored eventually. <laughs> oh, no matter what you do. I mean, no matter what you let's do. Let's say you decided to per perfect an instrument. You know, okay. Like, uh, the piano or guitar sure, or sure, whatever. Or the triangle or the glass. Well, how long would yeah, it yeah, take yeah. you? A hundred years? A thousand? Yeah. Maybe you know? four well, years if it's the only thing I'm doing, right? Like you can and, Or maybe you wanted to listen to every piece of music ever written. How long would that take you? Right. A thousand years? Right. I mean, what are you going to do for your 12 billionth birthday? You Make know, snowflakes. That's new and exciting. Make yeah. snowflakes, Larry. See now yeah. we now a there's... trillionth birthday or a trillion trillionth. Make di they're different. Every single one's different, Larry. Every mm. single one is different. You're making a brand new piece of art, <laughs> and it lands in a different space, and it melts, and it's gone. It's art. And it's, it's gone. Beautiful. Like it's temporary, yeah. and it's gone. So it, that what gives if it was... you a new a new uh, appreciation of the length of the human life. Mm. You know, the 80, 90 years. You know, as as compared to that unique piece of art that is a but, snowflake. There is a really nice corollary here or uh, analogy here where, or parallel train of thought with uh, Santa's workshop, right? Because, you know, Santa gives you toys if you're good, but he doesn't make the toys. He has elves make the toys and he's not making PlayStation 5s, right? Like all the toys that parents typically get their kids either have a serial number or a barcode or made in China or some sort of tag where you can track where they came from, a receipt, if mm -hmm. you will. And yeah. so if we were to... I believe that, okay, at least the coal that he gets has to come from somewhere, right? Well, coal's mined by people, and there's no coal up in North uh, North Pole. So, like, he's getting this stuff from somewhere. He has people helping them. He has elves helping him. So what is what are the elves doing all year round? They're making the the wooden toys that kids are like, oh, okay, well, you know, thanks. I appreciate that. Where's my next Apple app or tablet, you know? Or, like, the coal. They're mining the coal. They're getting Santa Claus, the stuff to make Santa be santa right they're feeding the reindeer they're doing mm -hmm. their tasks so when you're in heaven what if it was like a, a a toy factory sort of situation god's the face of the company right but like he needs people answering the phones or not answering the phones or he needs people like maintaining the it department uh he needs people you know uh fixing the blessings and 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 making maintaining the, the pneumatic tubes exactly it's for, all departments yeah. in a giant building uh -huh. like a corporation and mm -hmm. if you're like you know what i don't want to smite anybody today i don't want to like uh help a boxer win a, a blood fight <laughs> or a human combat can i just do it like a nice easy job it's like yeah 
snowflake department. It's the on the three hundred thousand yeah, so, floor. So Santa has his elves, and God has his angels for yes. for pr producing uh, whatever he wants produced. Correct. It's yeah, not to uncommon. Me that, it, oh, go it, for it. it makes sense that um, you know Santa Claus and his elves and stuff are like training wheels for kids for later on when they switch their belief to a, a more powerful being, a father figure in heaven. Yeah. You know, that, if anything, the Santa Claus story should be awareness to kids that parents will lie to you out right. of the sake of tradition. And you can either continue to lie and give it to your kids as part of like a tradition that you hand down, or you mm -hmm. can recognize that people in authority, mm, despite having your best interest in their heart, don't yeah. necessarily practice it in the most. Uh, well, it makes you way. wonder also how long they would hold on to that uh, uh, Santa belief if nobody told them it wasn't true Correct. because they usually get that information around age seven or so mm, somebody yeah. other kids or whatever the parents will tell them it's not true right but not the case in the uh, not the case in religion they don't right. they don't come by and, and get that information later on generally and the weird thing is it becomes culturally acceptable like if you were a 30 year old person who still believed in santa you'd be mocked for it right but mm -hmm. if you're four years old it almost be something enshrined and protected parents would get mm -hmm. angry if you try to tell a kid who's five right. years old hey there's no santa but if you're 25 years old it's like hey there's no santa what do you mean it's like you should have known that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but culturally we've made a decision though uh, however implicit it has been that there is a point where we can make fun of you for believing this because it's now a point of harm for you to continue to maintain this belief right though we've never done the same thing with religion or at least with a lot of dogmatic points of view and but certainly what, not here in america not only here in america definitely other countries that's absolutely mm -hmm. true though i have seen this happen if i was a kid who learned at seven years old or five or really young age that santa claus wasn't real I wouldn't be inherently dis disappointed. In fact, I figured that out myself. Like I, I like it's, uh, I, someone said, "Got uh, Santa visits you in your chimney," and I'm like, "Our house doesn't have a chimney. We're poor. We're like we have like a, a main line heater." Uh -huh. But if you're telling me G Santa Claus is visiting us, let me just put some paper in front of the heater, and if I see footprints in it tomorrow after like Christmas Eve, I'll I'll know whether Santa Claus visited us or not. And then my mom said Santa Claus came, and I'm like, I don't see footprints on the on the main line <laughs> heater. I've made the connection, but I'm all right because I still got the walkie talkies I wanted. <laughs> it's all fine with me. It's it's gravy. I don't I don't need a Santa Claus if he's not actually giving me stuff. It's all mm -hmm. good. So like that's that was my whole loop, and it wasn't harmful. I just moved on with the rest of my life. But I feel like with Christianity, what happens is you you don't have that opportunity to move on with the rest of your life. You are constantly changing right. your paradigm from how snowflakes look to how, why trees exist, to why certain people exist in certain parts of the world, why you're better than other people, why you are the chosen, why your family decided to marry these people, why you decided to marry this person. Like everything in your life has been dictated, whether you recognize it or not, by this mindset that you've had, that you never have the opportunity to just be like, whoa, I've invested so much in this that I can't just move on with the rest of my life because my life now is this. I've committed so much that it's painful it causes me hurt or like anxiety yeah, or pain. stress mm -hmm. just to try a different trend of life. And it's so culturally focused here that like other people in other countries, when they hear us talk about this, when John Richards hears us talk about why you guys, why are there so many Christians in America? It's like, because it's this whole echo chamber that we are visibly trying to break down step by step. And it goes all the way down to how we look at snowflakes. And so that's why, you know, it's important that we speak up on things like this and recognize that there's no fiction that will be greater than the fact of how objective reality works. And like when you come to an appreciation of like how mechanics work in science and then go back to a narrative of like, well, that God created everything, you realize there's a difference between an answer and an explanation. And once you have an explanation, you're like, oh, but this, once you can mm -hmm. appreciate an explanation, that's when you start saying yeah. to yourself, I can't go back to the God thing. It's not as satisfying. It doesn't explain things as well. It's just an answer. It's like having, you right. know, and have right. faith is just a, a a statement to get you to stop questioning. Yes, and just, you know, it, Be it doesn't sheep. give you answers. But you can believe anything on faith, mm. any religion on faith. Mm. So when they say just have faith, that just means stop questioning. Yes, I found yeah, and it's so scary that you're you. A Christian could hear that and be like, 
well, it's not like the Bible says that. <laughs> it's like, no, the Bible does say that. Jesus says that. Like, you're supposed to believe like a child. You're literally supposed to be a sheep. Blessed are those who don't question. Blessed are those who don't test. Like, the guy who came when Jesus returned and is like, hey, guys, I'm back. And one of the followers was like, I don't, I, I mean, can I at least even see your hands? I saw you nailed on a cross. You're telling me that's you? Mm -hmm. Like, who? And he was like, well, blessed are the people who don't have to see my hands, Stephen. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> He's yeah. like, someone write that down. 400 mm -hmm. years later, you guys are all illiterate. It's we're, well, I should have gotten some literate people uh -huh. instead of illiterate fishermen. Uh, oh, well. Yeah. Uh, and what's funny in the in the story of Thomas in the Bible, you know, when he, Thomas says, uh, you know, he doesn't believe it. He wants to feel the um, the wounds. Yeah. Jesus basically shames him into not feeling the wounds. Oh, yeah. Because he never Thomas. does actually feel the the, the wounds. Yeah, Downing Thomas is a whole point of ridicule for people mm -hmm. because a guy wanted to ask some questions. It mm -hmm. went from, you know, that's actually a legitimately good question to ask mm -hmm. when someone who is the most important person in your life apparently shows up again and could in a world where people can lie and trick mm -hmm. other people and be like, hey, can I at least just make sure you're the person that I've dedicated my well, life to? Especially when also in the scriptures, it says no, none of the disciples recognize him. I know when he, when he comes back. So he could be like his, his brother, right. <laughs> you know, and, or, or something. And I just want to be completely clear. Like this was like, everybody saw him die. <laughs> uh -huh. Right. There's no internet. There's no newspaper boy being like, Jesus rise. It's like, he woke up devastated three days after the fact that his Messiah is dead. And there was another guy being like, Hey, by the way, I'm back and I'm your Messiah. I'm like, one, I don't believe you, dude. Let me, let me look at yeah, this. You guy. don't look like him. Yeah. No one else recognizes it. Look, mm -hmm. Let me prove it. It's like, Oh, we're going to make fun of you for the rest of your uh, existence. I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't believe you, man. I don't know about this. I, I really do think that it's good to ask questions. It goes back to like, snowflake absolutely. Yeah. You can look at a snowflake and say, Hey, God made that. Or you can look at a snowflake and say, you know what? This is cool. How was it made? Right. And you can hear, appreciate the uh, the ignorance until you get to a better understanding of how forces of nature work or you can satisfy yourself with just that answer in the back of a book the answer in the back of the book being like a math book where it's like you just yeah. <clears throat> you just have some text in the back of the book and you're like answer to four is seven the answer to five is six and the answer to four is variable c and he's like i know math it's like you don't know math you just know a couple of answers in the back of the book once the questions change or if you have to go to a different field of math, you have no equipment ready to pass. You might pass this test because you had the answers in the back of a book, but you don't know math, right? right. In the same way, you can look at a snowflake mm -hmm. and be like, well, God made it, and you move on with the rest of your life. That might get you through America, right? But when America starts dealing with more difficult questions, or if you have evolved a culture, as a culture, or has become more multicultural, as we understand different problems for different parts of the world, or even different problems across the world. Or until you need some town. snow on a mountain that doesn't have snow in the winter, and you yeah. have to make a snow machine, that's yeah. not going to get you there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you have to make a snow machine for the Olympics, and you're like, well, God makes snowflakes, how do we make snow? It's like, yeah, yeah. someone hire an atheist. <laughs> no, the answer is nobody can make snowflakes but God, so just give up on it. Right, right, right. You just make a you make a cardboard box and you pray over it, and you're like, "This is gonna work, guys. Trust me." Mm -hmm. That should be so clear. Just yeah. looking at how we yeah. know how to make snowflakes should be proof of enough yeah. for you to and understand point, that this is a system that yeah. we can understand well. One point we want to make is ignorance is not uh, to be ashamed of. Everybody's born into ignorance. Right. Uh, maintaining or willful ignorance is, is something to be ashamed of. Yes. You, you, you know, you if you need answers, go find the answers. And right. Don't just accept somebody's claim, especially if it's a supernatural claim. Very true. Uh, if you were taught in your entire life that Santa Claus did exist and everyone in your town made you believe that consistently all the way until you're in your late teens, early adulthood, and then you finally move out of that town and people are like, hey, Santa Claus doesn't exist. You, there might be the sense of being mocked, but honestly, it's the culture that you're in fault. And it's not you personally. Unless if you, you know, aren't willing to accept the, the information as it comes and the evidence that's prevent, presented to you to show that perhaps you were from an environment that biased your outlook. Anyway, I think we're getting close to the, the bottom half. I saw you look up. I saw you look, hey, at, that saw timer. Me look at the clock. <laughs> I saw you look at the timer. I know that timer look. Yeah. Okay. This is the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour and WOZO Radio 103.9 LPF. I'm here in Knoxville, Tennessee. We'll be right back after this short break.
Welcome back to the second half of the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. I'm Dowder Five, and we're on WOZO Radio 103.9 LPFM here in Knoxville, Tennessee. And with us, we have uh, the Wombat. The Wombat. Let's take just a moment, though, to talk about the Atheist Society of Knoxville. ASK was founded in 2002. We're in our 21st year now, uh, 22nd going on, and we have over 1,100 members. We have weekly in-person meetings every Tuesday evening in Knoxville's Old City at Barley's Tap Room and Pizzeria. Look for us inside at the high top tables if it's cold outside or if it's warm outside on the deck. You can find us online on Facebook, meetup.com, or knoxvilleatheist.org. It's just that easy. If you don't live in Knoxville, you should still go to meet up and do a search for an atheist group in your town. Don't find one? Start right. one. Start one. All right. Wombat, where do you want to pick up? I saw a really cool YouTube video that I wanted to touch on. Uh, it's not about snowflakes, but it has the same nature of how we can let um, our initial biases color how we see things. And the more we invest in that bias, the harder it is for us to let go of it. And it's such a human condition that I feel like religion is very aware, or the best ones that that stick around are very aware of that nature, that human nature that we have, and in, in a sense, structure themselves in such a way to make sure that people make those initial investments as early as possible, as fervently as possible, so that it's much harder to let go in, at the end of a realization point or a critical point of conscious, right? And so what I brought up was a YouTube video called, and hear me out, it's called Satan's Guide to the Bible. I believe that's what it's called. Let me make sure I get the right term. It's called Satan's Guide right. to the Bible. Yeah. Yep. And the cool through line here is, okay, what if we were to say, regardless of how you were brought up, you, let's put you in the deepest echo chamber you are possibly in, and we will take the Bible as a point of fact. In fact, we will use all of the people in the Bible as, you know, objective witnesses for everything and take just this book as the only point of evidence to prove that just this book still has a significant amount of problems. And then whoever, who else to present it as not an atheist presenting the information and pointing out the flaws in the Bible or a biblical scholar, but in fact, Satan himself <laughs> or the adversary, because he's like, the, I, there's the two loyal adversary. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I'm not, they're confusing me with two completely different people here. But like, if you were to take the characters of Satan in the Bible and have them explain using the book as a point of source, the only really the true source in the Bible, that there's conflicts within how the book is structured in terms of its errancy, in terms of how vile uh, the God figure is. In both the Old Testament, which is often taken as a, well, of course, but the fact that uh, Old Testament God may punish you temporarily for war crime, you know, cut off, like, uh, kill your family, burn your house down, turn your wife into a pillar of salt. The New Testament God will literally burn you in an eternal fire for all of eternity. Like, there's a much For the worse, sake of torture and no, the no remedial um, processes there. Yeah, it's grinding just your for, teeth in agony. For pain. Just for yeah, pain. for eternity. Like there's a le there's a whole magnitude of evil vileness in the in the New Testament God. Yeah, a lot of people will point to the New Testament God and be like, oh, but that's a nice one. And the vast mm -hmm. one was always like, no, it's completely opposite. This new God is had came up with a whole bunch of new fetishes. He's very bad. Um, but also just the idea of like, what is the messaging of this Bible and what secrets or what what deliberately overlooked parts of the Bible exist that pastors know about who go through seminary so that they don't have to be caught off guard when members of their congregation bring it up to them and how they can always work through the nature of how to present data to them in a way that's not necessarily fully, I would say, um, open with, with, with the nature of the book. It's not like they're reading one chapter at a time going all the way through the Bible. They're just hitting like the greatest hits and deliberately walking away around the points where the Bible endorses slavery or the Bible talks about, uh, um, uh, I, I can't say the word on YouTube, but sexual assault. And then also, um, smashing babies heads on rocks and and then the concept of witches existing and like uh the fact that israelites were were basically a sect of or mm -hmm. a type of canaanite which if you that doesn't blow your mind you should watch this video satan's guide to the bible because it yeah. turns the entire concept of who god's chosen people are entirely on its head 
because now you have basically just one of many groups of different tribes that believe in various different kinds of gods. Now you understand why God's like, there's no other gods before me. I was like, what other gods are you talking about, God? <laughs> hey, mm -hmm. Don't, 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 don't listen yeah. to that. I'm yeah. the only God. <laughs> yeah. And we can't, we can't have them eating the, the, the fruit because then they will become like us. Who's yes. us? <laughs> yes. And punctuated throughout this entire video is, and this is getting to my point, is these child uh, songs, these biblical songs, like um, Bible study music and ditties sung by children that reminded me when I was in Bible study growing up and I would sing these songs like uh, like our God's an awesome God, left foot, right foot. Uh, my my scripture is my artillery. Like there's some songs where I'm thinking like, whoa, in the context of being an atheist for so long that I've been now and hearing these songs again, I'm actually really creeped out that not only did I sing these songs, but I didn't understand the weight behind them nor the intention behind them. I thought I was just having a fun time with friends and we're all having a good time just singing songs and it was great. But it actually turned out that like I was being committed or I was being in, uh, inculcated, ingrained, indoctrinated more or less. Indoctrinated. Into like, yeah. yeah, into the system that was deliberately targeting kids in a way that made kids feel involved and accepted in a way to further perpetuate this really terrible system of of false hope and man to see parents do that still even to today you know it yeah. it, it hurts unquestioningly yeah it hurts because they think they're doing the best thing right but like even when you present the evidence or even when the evidence exists i mean it's been existing for a while now right uh it's just a shame and to get to the same level in the same way we can both a uh, christian and a scientist could look at a snowflake and still appreciate it i can look at the the indoctrination of children in, in in churches and feel a sense of woe that i feel like can't be matched by someone who is in the same religion but outside of the of the religion would be matched so a muslim would look at a bible study for with a bunch of christians and be like man that's terrible i can't believe they're forcing all those children to not believe in allah but believe in jesus christ and i'm like i also feel <laughs> whoa whoa but i you know, the Christians are looking at your Bible study versions, your Quran vers versions, where they're like bowing to God, at pointing to Mecca five times a day. And, and they think that's a terrible thing, too. But like we're at, we're getting to the same point from completely different journeys. And I guess I just wish we could like come to the same conclusions. Like we both agree that snowflakes are awesome, right? We both agree that childhood indoctrination is bad, right? Can I don't think they, they would. I don't think they would agree with that. that you don't think one. they would if it was a different religion? That's true, but you know they do believe in it wholeheartedly for their own religion. Right, right, right. Yeah. That's the <clears throat> that's the hang up. That's why yeah. I say the scientific approach is better because you know obviously when they're pointing at a snow thing, it says my God made this. The Muslim guys saying yeah my God made this, and the Christians saying yeah my God made the snowflake, and they can't both be well, right. Right. Yeah, well, technically, uh, since Judaism and Christianity and, and uh, Islam are all based on the same religion and they're based on the same God, they just call them different things. But it's all it's all Yahweh and it all comes from the ancient uh, Jewish texts. I mean, they there's Jewish um, religion is like God 1.0 and Christianity is God 2.0 and Islam is God 3.0. You know, they just keep changing and adding to it and making it the way they want it to be, you know, and saying it's the word of God. Uh, but now if you were to jump with a different religion like uh, Hinduism or um, Jainism or something like that, then, of course, it would be totally different gods. And they would still be supporting childhood uh, indoctrination for that particular God. Right. I also now, say, get, go ahead. I'll, I'll throw this out, too. I agree that, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's all Judaism. But a Hindu and a Jainist or uh, someone with a Pasifarian point of view can all point at the same snowflake and be like, it's my God that made that. They right. can't all be right. They can't all be wrong. And it's only the science guy who's saying, actually, I can just make some snowflakes for you right now. Yeah. Would you mm -hmm. like to see how they're made? I have a whole machine mm -hmm. that does it for it. We use in this in the Olympics. It's, it's, it's pretty common knowledge of how these things are made. And it can yeah. happen naturally, too. Yeah. Uh, Getting get back to the inerrancy of of the video pointing sure. out inerrancies of the Bible, did they give you any particular uh, examples? Yeah, I mean, that you'd like to bring to the show. 
Yeah, and I think it might be useful to to bring up the the example that you also had, where it's like um, Ju Judaism is like 1.0, Christianity is like 2.0, Islam is like 3.0. Um, through the videos, I was able to come to an appreciation that Christ uh, Christianity, as we've come to know it, did not happen in a, a linear trajectory. In fact, the New Testament, there's a section of the book that shows like the books of the Old Testament versus the books of the New Testament. And I always, I even I was under the impression that it was at least like a half and half split. Right. But it's actually, it's not, it's not even close. It's, it's not about 80, close. 20. Yeah. Like that. And, and when you think about it like that, you're like, whoa, the most of this book is this Old Testament. So how did we, which is the Jewish texts. How, and how did we throw all this out? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> For basically a couple of cover pages and like an epilogue. Like this seems, it seems like we should be focusing more on the Old Testament stuff. And and people are like, no, 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 we don't listen to that. So like the the issue of like uh inerrancy is is uh an interesting one. Only and I want let me get to this last, last one more point. The it's not 1.0, 2.0, 3.0 from like uh Jewish Christian to Islam. It's more of like version 0 0.46, 0 0.4614B, yeah. because this bifurcated substantially so many times right yeah there are thousands of different versions of christianity alone correct correct much less judaism and islam absolutely and and the scary thing is um the well I, i'd say scary but like the idea of um people who look into the conflicts that occur in the bible tend to do so from a protestant point of view the, the biblical scholars that exist are largely those that are just from one bifurcation of Christianity, which is those who don't follow the Catholic point of view. And Catholic point of view has its completely own different, you know, set of like mm -hmm. skeletons in the closet. And sure. it's only for, as you mentioned, like roughly 20% of a holy book. And then in the video, they also talk about the people who talk about the Old Testament and like the, the, like the old Judaic Jewish scholars. And you're like, Oh, oh my gosh, I'm only barely aware of all the problems that are in the Bible from like my Protestant point of view. You're telling me Catholic souls have a problem and the Jewish have a problem. And like, we're only talking about 20% of the book that we're largely familiar with. There's a lot of problems in this book. Yeah. 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 <laughs> to the point yeah. where like people are publishing New York Times bestselling books on this on a regular basis. There's conventions where people come together and talk about like the problems that are in this book on a yearly basis, uh, multiple years. They'll have multiple throughout the entire year. It's it's a it's an interesting conflict. Specific points of inerrancy. Um, of errancy. <laughs> of inerrancy is that there is a... Oh, go ahead. Inerrancy means no problem, no, right. no mistakes. So, so er errancy is where what we're going to bring up here. Correct. And the reason why we're bringing that up is there's two uh, points of view. One is that the book of God is completely perfect and there is no error in it whatsoever. Right. And that the second point of view is that's not the correct point of view, right? It's, <laughs> that's not true. And yeah. the point of conflict that comes to the Bible is that a lot of the writing that is in the Bible is not consistent with people who would have been able to write that book at that point in time. And so what you have is basically this concept of uh, informed prophecies where David is explaining how things happened in, in his, not only in this timeline, but what will happen in the future. And people are saying, oh, look at David accurately prophesizing that the the pharisees will do these certain things that these troops will move this direction that culture will move in this way and he didn't know that because he wouldn't be around for 400 years after the fact unless and this is what the counterculture says is well he didn't one he didn't write that <laughs> and two, <laughs> so whoever did knew that because he wrote it way after the fact and just right. wrote it in place <clears throat> of david in the place well that that also brings up the area the era problem with prophecy in the new testament um whoever wrote the new testament had the old testament at hand mm. they could easily have written anything they wanted to to fulfill the prophecy of the old testament right and and then the question becomes well how does that prove the books inerrant the the, the problem is is you run into situations where you have a more easy solution to 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 writing a prophecy which is basically 
just write it for someone. I can write a prophecy for what happened from COVID time all the way from 9-11 to like the war in Afghanistan to, to Desert Storm. I'm sorry, uh, errant. Uh, what's the what's the phrase that I'm looking for, Larry? Sell it to me one more time. I'll try not to mess it up. What I was just going to say. Inerrancy? Inerrancy? The book is it, inerrant, right? That's what Christians are If it's inerrant, it means it has no errors. Correct. That's what Christians are saying. Their book is right. saying that their book is inerrant. Right. But there's conflicts that come with how the book is written with regard to validating that the people who wrote it actually did write it. Uh, the, oh, yeah. We have no idea uh, who any of the original authors were. And this is the point of of inerrancy because christians will argue their name is on the book how do you mean you don't know who wrote uh the book well, how, how many it's how many luke's and person. john's do you have in in the uh, middle east in the, back 2000 years ago matthews you have a lot of matthews back then not only that but like self-described fishermen who are illiterate who write not only in the length who aren't writing the book in the original language of the people who spoke that language or at mm -hmm. that time, but wrote it in Greek, which mm -hmm. is in a completely different part of the world. And you're telling me that these a, illiterate fishermen wrote in Greek. Yeah. <laughs> illiterate fishermen then moved to a completely different part of the world, walked there or something like that. And mm -hmm. then wrote a book after mastering the language in Greek. And then that was what was published or you, many years after the fact, like there's, there's points of contention when you look at the way how every single book in the Bible was written. And the problem is, you know, there's enough examples where the easier solution is other people wrote the book, right? And, and to the go to, people wrote the book, period. Just other people wrote the yeah. book and they already knew yeah. the stuff that happened in the past and, and mm -hmm. they just put it in after the fact. And that's yeah. why it seems like there's prophecies. That's a much easier explanation. Doesn't necessarily mean that it's the true one, but it's the one that comes with the least number of assumptions. And there is a rule that I typically tend to follow, and it's, you might have heard of Zakam Razor. It doesn't mean the simplest answer is the most accurate one. It's the one that comes with the least number of assumptions, right? And so the biggest assumption is that there's a miraculous supernatural God <laughs> that exists, that loves us, that's making snowflakes in, in his toy shop every day, you mm -hmm. know, every single flake that falls to the ground. Or people, after the fact, wrote history put it into a holy book as if they were the actual characters at play and did so in such a poor manner that it was very easily determined that one, they didn't write the the letters and the books that they claim to have uh, from their point of view. And that two, they were writing them in different languages that <laughs> you mm. like, they didn't know Greek there. Like you should know that you should know that. And then three, like they, in the book, they say they're not literate. Like, what's the problem? <laughs> the problem in the literacy here, too. It's mm. Mesopotamian era Bronze Age kids, guys. So it's, little, you know, it's just, it's a weird problem. It's a weird yeah. problem that right. stacks well, that's, up to a number of issues with. That's currency. just the technical part. I mean, mm. there's the logical parts of the of the stories themselves that make no sense. Like uh, what we're saying before the show that um, you know, God wanted uh, Pharaoh to let his people go, right? Yeah. Why does God, an omniscient, I'm I'm the powerful person, you know, who created the universe and do anything he wants, need Pharaoh's permission? Right. It could have just poofed all of the Israelites from where they were, poof where he wants them. You know, right. That's it. Why yeah. does he need to kill people? Why does he need to uh rain down, you know, plagues onto the earth, Killing you know, the and first kill firstborns? Yeah, yeah, all that. It's just and the thing that really gets me about that is at the point where Pharaoh was about ready to let him go, yeah, God God hardened his heart so he wouldn't. So he right. had to go through all this plague stuff and killing the firstborn. Right. And when it was not necessary at all, all it, of these um, unlogical things are just, um, mis miscarriages of logic, you know, are it, in the Bible. And that's just one story. No, let me tell you something. Mm -hmm. uh, the entire Bible kind of strikes me as like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, where at the time, this was probably the coolest thing that came out. 
You know, when people are like, have you read the Bible? It's like, no, I can't. I can't read. It's like, okay, I'll find someone to read the Bible for you. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's the way how it mostly went. So you sit down and you get this cool experience like fed to you. And you're like, whoa. And those superpowers. And you try to tell your friends about it. And they're like, man, this guy really likes the Bible. Like he's like almost like a Bible light, if you will. And then it's the same thing with Marvel. You see like the end game, Marvel's end game. You see like Thanos. And you're like, whoa, what a cool villain. And then there's a period of time. There's a period of time where you like think back on like the stuff that happened and you're like, wait a second, Thanos wanted to snap his fingers and kill half of half all the universe. universe? Mm -hmm. Why didn't he just snap his fingers and make twice as much stuff? If yeah. he's worried um, about space, so much more, more he planets. Just, yeah, he could have yeah. just made twice as much stuff. Why did he kill half as much people to take it? That doesn't even long term solve the problem. This is a dumb mm -hmm. plan. You can yeah. do the same thing with the Bible. You're like, wait a second. God hardened the Pharaoh's heart. God put an apple within reaching distance in Eve. Uh, God, like, did, like, why didn't you just, <laughs> why did you just make, if you wanted to have slaves, why didn't you just make robots that, like, yeah. can do work for people? And why didn't he put the, the app, the fruit, fruit tree on the moon? Yeah, you know, he, why did why did you give us two garden. nipples, God? Why did yeah. you give man and women nipples? That makes no sense if we were creating your image. There's a lot and of didn't he know? There. Is he not omniscient? Didn't yeah. he know what was going to happen? Why'd you waste did all this time on snowflakes? Why'd you it's waste more all like he just set a, a trap for humanity in the Garden of Eden? Correct. But there's no such thing as a paradise if you have a trap in it. But what it does speak to is poor writing. Wait, right? It's mm -hmm. because there's an oversight. Maybe there was a, a writer's revision meeting one day where, you know, a guy in a robe in Mesopotamia was like, you know what? You should come up with a reason why the Pharaoh still decided to <laughs> try to get back all those slaves. Because it seems like he's a cool dude. He seems he's like, oh, okay. You know what? I'm just going to let him go. I'm already rich. We're going to be okay. Let's let him leave. It's like, no, we got to, we have to come up with a reason why God would still like harden his heart right it's like okay fine we'll, we'll put this edit in it's not going to have any problems it's still a great book we'll still make a lot of millions of rubies or whatever pebbles or lock lacra or whatever <laughs> money they had back then but the whole idea is it's it reeks to me of revisionist writing which is in the heart of how the bible came to be right it's like uh oral traditions that got written down eventually but and then through committee manufactured oh, yeah, away. But through through miss miscopying or even through intention where people literally wanted to change what, the word of God so that it would support their views. Absolutely. Their, you know, their rule. Right. And I feel like the Marvel stories, even though we take them as a point of fiction, are constructed in no different of a, of a capacity. Like if I were to explain to you the entire MCU timeline, I'm going to mess up stuff left and right. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get the order of movies wrong. Right. I'm going to get the order of events wrong. But if I'm one of four people that you've talked to about the MCU to the point where you documented what I say, there's going to be conflicts in how we have narrated the story such that the two versions of Genesis aren't even in order with regard to how the order of the universe was created, right? right. And like the four stories of the people who apparently, through their own admission, like saw Jesus Christ live and die, you know, or and, and then live again. And <laughs> who knows what else afterwards, their stories aren't even lining up. And when we realize like these people who you've interviewed for the movies, weren't even the people who seem and saw the movies you interviewed it, like their kids or their grandkids who just heard stories, maybe about their yeah. grandparents because they weren't actually there at the time movies because of COVID there's no more movie theaters anymore. <laughs> yeah. The game of telephone all over again. <laughs> yeah. And you're thinking like, wait a second. So you're telling me that when I finally made my final report based off the grandkids who saw the MCU movie, that this final report is in is inerrant. It's perfect in every way. There's no way. In fact, it's going to reek up all these hallmarks of problems that would happen from playing a game of telephone. And when we look at the Bible, we see the game of telephone. We see people who aren't the people writing the books. We see people who couldn't possibly be in the same region or the same timeline. We see conflicting stories. We see people pointing uh, at the same thing and telling completely different stories. Like there's not a compatibility here. And yet when you bring that up to seminaries or what you go to and, and Satan's Guide to the Bible, in seminary schools, they have a means of dealing with those conflicts, which is ignore them. And it's a, a concerted effort on their part to say, you either believe it or you don't believe it. And if you don't believe it, you're reading the Bible wrong. In fact, they say like right-minded people read the Bible rightly. And if you, right. <laughs> if you don't, you're wrong. And right. I'm like, put that burden on me, even though I'm pointing out a doubt that's so messed up. 
Yeah. You know. And if, if the listener would like to get some more details on a lot of the problems with the Bible, I would sure. recommend a book called Misquoting Jesus by yeah. Bert Ehrman. That's yep. E-H-R-M-A-N. Bart, sorry, Bart Ehrman. Uh, excellent book. He also has put out like a dozen other books. Yep. Uh, uh, that's a good one to get started on anyway. And Ehrman's also uh, featured, not as a main point of citation, but as like featured in the video that we're referring to, Satan's Guide to the Bible. And you'll be like, who's Bert Ehrman? You'll find out by the end of the video. It's actually really, really good watch. I highly recommend it. And the cool thing is it stays compacted. It's not pulling any sources from anywhere else. It's just saying, listen, if we took this book for what it is, let's just read it. I'm a character from the Bible. I'm not even looking at this objectively outside. If we are in this Bible locked in, there's still problems. Right. Still the of logic of it all. Right, right. This doesn't look like a perfect story. If you want a yeah. perfect story, if you want a perfect story, let's see. What's a perfect story, Larry? I think you did. You, would you say your book is perfect? <laughs> no, it may have some perfect ones in it, but no. Nah. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I, there's. I don't think there's anything ever written a perfect story. Mm. Um, but um, I'm trying to think, but it's, nothing's coming to me. Yeah, like any points of literature that I would recommend as like a better, I can I can definitely think of better books. I would almost say yeah. any book that doesn't. Romeo and Juliet comes to book. mind. Romeo I mean, and was, Juliet. That was okay. pretty good. Yeah. Okay, I mean, okay, okay. I don't see my, many logical flaws in that one. All right, all right, all right. I mean, I can definitely recommend some good uh, comic books. I think like Batman Year One works as a good book if you just want to see like or Hawkeye the the. I think 2017 version of Hawkeye, the past the purple text from beginning mm -hmm. to end. That's a very nice compact story that like is drawn so cinematically that you feel like you're watching the movie, but the it's character driven throughout the entire time and using a lesser known character. So they can do a lot of flexibility with how everything's written, but oh. there's books that I'd recommend. There's games that I'd recommend that all have better narratives. Are they perfect? No, yeah. but the flaws are what make them interesting. And none of them advocate for slavery. None of them advocate to indoctrinate your children and make them yeah. believe that snowflakes <clears throat> are, are a hobby right. project by yeah. a supernatural God. Yeah. One of the biggest things, uh, problems I have with Christianity is that the, the way that the followers always say that God is love. Mm -hmm. I mean, have they read the Bible? I mean, it's like all he does is think of things that to kill us or give us plagues. Or, uh, I mean, his most common interaction with humanity is to give us plagues. He's passionate, Larry. That's what they mean by love. Love is passion. Haven't you ever been given a plague by the, the love of your life? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. But okay. I can see where that might happen. <laughs> sure, 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 sure. But, uh, uh, I mean, in, in one part, and actually about three different passages that he says that the Bible tells you that if you don't follow the the exact words that are in the Bible, God will force bring you so low you will eat your children. Oh. I mean, what kind of a loving God would even think about doing that, much less bring it to fruition? Right. It almost, I mean, in this grander context, it just feels like God is just one of a bunch of evil gods that were worshipped, but it wasn't actually real. Yeah, and he rules people. through fear, like most dictators. And he dictators. rules through fear, and he was successful yeah. enough to get a bunch of people to believe in him and follow his will, which was enacted by assuming that they were good and forcing very medieval justice on other people to the point where we're still suffering for it even up to today. So if that yeah. was the na the great plan of the God, it's, it's it has to be an evil plan because it's only the forces of good, science, medicine, better understanding, compassion, empathy, that are blocking and inhibiting this being, right? It's it's none of the none of the ill wills that Christians claim that are like are there are front to their gods, like um uh, uh I don't know, slavery, misjustice, um, tribalism or just rude people. Uh whatever whatever Christians don't like isn't what's being advocated in their book. In fact, if anything, everything that they dislike is presented in their book as one of the hallmarks of how to behave or, or act. Um, like, don't harm people. Like, every every single commandment in the book is broken in the book, is all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. like, by the God. by Either by the God or by people who claim to speak or act for the God. It's just an insane degree of juxtaposition and hypocrisy. And so why do we put up with it? And the question is, we don't have to. Or the answer is, we don't have to. Uh, we have a better explanation for how things come. We about. have better answers. 
And mm. we have better wings of conduct, thankfully, that our laws are governed by. And even though Christians are trying to twist it back, we are consistently progressively moving forward, though we just wish we didn't have as much inhibition or feet dragging because we can all benefit from the advancements of society in this capacity. And my main takeaway is snowflakes are beautiful. Go, go look at them and understand why they are beautiful. Don't just take them for granted, right? Um, yeah, understand them. Get a basic understanding of how they, how they form, where they uh what temperatures you have to have what kind of nucleus you have to have to, yep. to get the the crystals to form and under, it's easy i mean it's one of the easiest things easy. you can do you can buy a snow machine that makes snowflakes like you can buy this thing we know how these are made so like the same tools that we're using to make them is the same stuff that exists out of nature because at the end of the day we're just parts of nature just trying to figure out how right. nature works that's it and no one of the necessary. best quotes of uh, carl sagan is that we don't have to believe anymore. We can, we are at a point in humanity where we can understand mm. and religion uh, stops you from making that leap from belief to understanding. Right. It's like, thanks for all the fish, but we're good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do you have any listener comments that may have come up? No listener comments, but I do recommend yeah. that anyone check out Satan's Guys of the Bible. It's yeah. a really good book <clears throat> that I can't give to my, I can't send the link to my mom because she would flip and it'd be like a whole four hour conversation. Oh, really? Afterwards. Well, maybe a conversation worth having. Uh, bring, bring some coffee with you. <laughs> oh my gosh. Like the force. I know you have like to that. pick your battles. <laughs> I got to pick your battles, Larry. Yeah. yeah but if yeah. you are free minded, highly recommend you check it out. There's some really cool stuff here. Wouldn't recommend you using it in an argument, but it's good stuff to know because it's good to know stuff, period. Yeah. And it's good to understand your, the world that you're living in. Correct. Uh, it causes less pain and more um, profit as it were. Mm -hmm. um, this guy, uh, uh gave me a comment on my uh, pascal's wager video okay on on youtube i have a video called Pas pascal's wager is invalid anyway he said uh oh so what if the god what if you get to the pearly gates and instead of finding saint peter you you find uh thargrod the party demon and he asks you and not if you've been good but did you have a good time <laughs> 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 yeah. I thought that was pretty funny. Be, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that's part of Pascal's wager, you know. Mm. Given the fact that you die and you have a soul and it goes somewhere after you die, which is a, a, a quite a stretch. But I mean, you can get to heaven and maybe you see Egyptian gods. You don't what was know. the name of that god again? Nobody knows. Uh oh, he just made up a name called Thar Thargrod. Yeah, that's a god that yeah. I can stand behind. Uh, yeah, the party you go to the guy. Pearly Hades, he's like, <laughs> did you have a good yeah. time? Yeah. yeah. Well, he, uh, uh, the Romans had a party god. What was his name? Uh, the guard of wine, god of wine and good Let's time. See. That dry. It starts with a D. Uh, um, god, god. Our listeners will will answer it in the Di comments. I'm Dionysus. Sure. Dionysus. Yeah. Yes. That was yeah. Pretty good. The god of grapes and wine and parties. Or Bacchus. Because Bacchus. Bacchus. That's yes. the one I was thinking of. Yeah. yeah. Same God, different names. And to speak of conflicts throughout history, yeah. look at the Roman pantheon. And the fact that Roman pantheon affects how we live our lives as Christians, that we have days of the week named after Roman gods and we have more mm -hmm. and, and, and Nordic gods and our planets are named after. It's such a bizarre hodgepodge. It doesn't uh -huh. look like a perfect book. It just looks right. like a bunch of people playing telephone. That's yeah. it. Larry, we, we are so over time. We got to close out now. Uh, okay. Go ahead and tell us uh, what we can do to find your works. I'm on YouTube. You can find me on Let's Chat on YouTube. And I got a bunch of old school SE videos and I have a bunch of new podcasts. Just check them out if you want to. And if not, check out Satan's Guide to the Bible. It's a really good video. Worth your an hour. You'll be, in, you'll be indoctrinated into <laughs> a yeah. new level of understanding. <laughs> yeah. You can find my stuff online at digitalfreethought.com. Be sure to click on the blog button. I have a book on Amazon called Atheism. What's it all about? Oh. Remember, everybody is going to somebody else's hell. The time to worry about is when they prove that heavens and hells and souls are real. Until then, don't sweat it. Enjoy your life. And we'll see you next Wednesday night at 7 o'clock here on WOZO Radio. Say bye, everybody. Bye, bye everybody. Bye. And that's a wrap. <laughs>